Hi everyone, uh, I welcome you all to this conversation titled as International Communication and Chinese, China's Digital Silk Road. I am Fahmid al uh, Visiting Professor of Bart College, New York, and we are having a, a guest with us, Anis Rahman, who is uh, basically an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Communication at the University of, of Washington. Seattle. Dr. Anis teaches courses about cultural impact of information technology and the geopolitics of the internet. His current research projects uh, range from digital activism and public internet to South Asian media and politics. I welcome Anis to this conversation. Anis, how are you doing? Great. Thank you, Dr. Huck, for having me. Okay. Um, uh, as you know, this is a series of uh, some conversations uh, I'm assigned to uh, conduct this semester at Bard College. And today, uh, you are my last guest, the fifth conversation here uh, we are uh, conducting. We, we should take this conversation in two parts. Uh, first, as the background of this today's uh, China's Digital Silk Road. Uh, and, and the second part is uh, what is actually happening in this uh, project uh, initiated by China uh, in the global context. First question is to you, how do you see uh, historically the, the flow of information, global flow of information, especially in post Second World War scenario? Uh, we, we know about this uh, news agencies. Uh, today we, we see a global, um, global media scenario, uh, but uh, after the Second World War, it was it was not like that. Uh, it was quite limited, but the flow was from one side to the other side, as I know. Uh, so can you please extend this? Sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. That's a great question. So to review very briefly the history of global communication, how it is today. Before World War II, it was actually primarily dominated by the West, and it is still dominated by the West. But um, who dominates what part and who are the emer emerging uh, industries? That is changing. So in pre-World War II era, telecommunications, especially um, let's say telegraph, and then later news agencies, um, like including Reuters, AFP, they both have been dominated by either United States or United Kingdom, because United Kingdom was the most colonial force, biggest, largest mm -hmm. colonial force on earth, uh, including capturing South Asia and large part of Africa, uh, competing with other colonialist and slave trading nations. So there they needed the international infrastructures of communication for maintaining their empire. And many of the infrastructures emerged in that context. So although I'll be talking about China, but I want to also locate uh, China's importance in relation to South Asia. And that is my primary uh, area of research interest. And that's where I see uh, both West and the East yeah, you know, like uh, using South Asia as its playground. And that's where a large part of the contestation for media power and communication infrastructure power is happening in modern day. So South Asia was a playground for uh, British Empire to experiment uh, public service broadcasting. Uh, so mm -hmm. starting from radio um, and they had to decolonize, they had to leave before even television was the most important media, which later in 1960s, it became in that region. Uh, but after World War II, what happened, United States emerged as the most unchallenged uh, and the biggest military force and economic force on earth. So United States dominated the global flow of information, not necessarily just uh, telegraph, uh, let's say television later, but also very uh, you know, prominently in 1970s and 80s onward is satellite television in which majority of the international television productions as well as film production used to be dominated by the United States companies. And they were often uh, contested at the local level. For example, Bollywood in South Asia has been historically mm -hmm. um, a contending force against any other bigger powers or cultural uh, superior powers, uh, be it linguistic or racial, Bollywood always had its own uh, signature and you are an expert of that field. Uh, what China was uh, going through is that after centuries of shame, they identified it as uh, the defeat period of where Chinese empire fell uh, because of the foreign conquests and uh, wars fighting with uh, during both um, 
uh, Xing Dynasty and later on uh, after that uh, internal fighting uh, against uh, two parts of the China, which give birth to eventually uh, the modern day Communist Party of China that mm -hmm. uh, actually came as a result of internal struggle as well as uh, what they inherited uh, from the previous dynastic uh, rul rulers of China. So they lost uh, Taiwan and uh, Macau and part of Hong Kong and part of Shanghai to point uh, invaders and that they had to struggle a lot to recover from that. So China was not a factor in international communication until uh, let's say 1980s. Uh, but China has, we know that a very long history, like uh, 5,000 years histories of innovations. So most of the modern innovations of communication tools, such as papers, uh, part of printing press, um, also um, other infrastructures, they actually were originated from China, including even if you call paper money that we use today, it was first invented and popularized in China. So China's imperial history has some legacy in its modern day innovation that has been changed the, through the uh, use of those technologies for the ruler's purpose to now the party's purpose, right? Okay. Um, um, uh, we'll hear more from uh, you about the Chinese modern day uh, innovations and especially their uh, say intervention in global communication. But let's go back again to the background discussion uh, especially I'm interested to hear about um, the, 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 the contest from the non-aligned movements and movement like New World Information and Communication Order, maybe in 1970s. Exactly. Yeah, uh, can, uh, before coming to this modern day uh, Chinese uh, communication approaches, global approaches, let's discuss about this uh, context. Yes, uh, so China became a factor on, not until 1970s and 80s, but the reason I was uh, pointing towards uh, China's internal struggle because they are parallel to the decolonization movement. Uh, so in 1940s, 50s and 60s, we know that throughout the world, uh, the empires had to leave most of their colonies, especially the British colonies at the, in the aftermath of Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, so many countries became newly independent and gained country status in the United Nations. Many countries were still having internal uh, fractions. For example, Bangladesh was not born after British left. Mm -hmm. It was born much later in 1971 uh, with infighting or they call it civil war with Pakistan, right? With the support of Indian uh, help. Uh, but during this period in 1950s, what happened that uh, many uh, leaders of the newly decolonized countries um, they got together and they saw that the world is dividing into two parts. One is the capitalist bloc led by the United States and its allies in Western Europe. Another is the Soviet Union uh, led by its allies, uh, including like Cuba and part of Latin America and part of Asia or what we understand as Central Asia today. Uh, so they did not want to belong to any part because they really have big scars from the um, colonial tortures, wars, struggles, resistance, and finally they got liberation. They did not want to fall into the camp of another uh, imperial power. So they wanted to, uh, let's say, detach themselves from either block. So the first block is the capitalist block. The second one, or so-called second world, is the communist world. And the third world, that's why the notion of third world comes in. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily third in ranking, mm -hmm. but third in terms of options. So that's why the third world movements come in. They say that we want to create an unity of the alliances of the countries that has been formerly colonized. And we want to um, you know, distinguish ourselves, not a part of the Cold War, but away from the Cold War. So uh, they would, did not want to belong to either a part and that they had a passive and detente policy um, that uh, they want to have a greater mobility of uh, trade, resource, understanding between the global South countries um, in order to gain an equal footing in international relations in all spheres. So that was the spirit of non-aligned movement, which was materialized in 1950s, first starting in a conference in Bandung in Indonesia, and later uh, joined by uh, many other countries. And it, it was primarily founded by what we understand today as former 
autocratic or authoritarian rulers, but also popular, for example, Jawaharlal Nehru from India, uh, Kwame uh, Nurma from Ghana, Gamal uh, Abdel Nasser from Egypt, Sukarno from Indonesia, and Joseph Tito from Yugoslavia. Uh, so many countries, including uh, former Pakistan, uh, which was part of Bangladesh and um, uh, other countries joined this NAM movement. Uh, China was also a supporter because they wanted to also benefit from this new geopolitical alliance. It did not materialize the de uh, demand of the non-aligned movement in terms of communication industry that we need to have a new information and communication world order, which they placed um, in relation with the UNESCO. So UNESCO was uh, another headache of the United States because UNESCO wanted to, the McBride Commission report pointed out that there's a one-way flow of media and cultural industry and content and ideology from the West to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So they saw it as a lack of diversity and it's a problem for democratic world order in which global South has very little voice uh, and they are not able to you know, reverse flow their culture into the West. Uh, or benefit from it. So the United Nations UNESCO part actually supported more diversity. They indirectly mm -hmm. supported Global South's protectionist policy in which the Western media content may not enter uh, into the cultural markets of the Global South without restrictions. So that was the neoliberal world order starting, right, in 1970s and 80s. TV show, um, film product are also commodities. So they should also have the equal right like uh, automobiles, potato, oil, uh, minerals, gaining into any newly developed market. Mm -hmm. So United States and Western European countries, they wanted to have that access, primarily United States and uh, other countries, they did not uh, want that, want uh, like significant portion of our film to be um, you know, covered by the Western product. So they, they wanted to have higher tax and more restricted policies. For example, a large part of the artist has to be local and it has to contribute to local film market first or the money they will get from the high tax and revenues will be invested into the local film production. So the, Canada has adopted that policy, but Global South was having this struggle for identity as well as resources in which they saw if we liberalize our market, we get greater foreign direct investments. But if we insulate our cultural market from that, we can still use it for our own cultural uh, identity building. Many countries, they just got independent. They need to know what they belong to, right? Uh, what their country identity means, what the citizenship means. So many uh, state broadcaster was you know, not privatized. So they saw it uh, both from Western point of view, that this is authoritarian, um, you know, like, let's say a grab of media institutions and it, which is true. But at the same time, the Western media was not necessarily liable or responsible for promoting local diversity or voices. So th there yeah. were both support and push and pull against it. So under this context, uh, UNESCO's um, McBride Commission report and the recommendation that Global South should have their own media culture industry without the influence of the West, um, United States did not like it. And they eventually actually left um, UNESCO as part of that. Um, and that they, since then, in, in United States is still critical of UNESCO's media diversity policies like that. And, and actually that project uh, failed at the end, right? In w yes, and... that's because of the neoliberalization of telecom. That's why it has started. Uh, and, so and satellites- on that point, we, mm -hmm. we, we started seeing global media, a rise of global media, especially in the context of the rise of neoliberal economic policies, in especially mm -hmm. began in U USA and the UK and later after the fall of communism in the, in the whole world, world actually. But uh, the, the lack of diversity actually uh, allowed to, uh, to the rise of if only a few uh, global media instead of uh, many global media, right? And what was China's approach in that time, especially since 1990s uh, and in the beginning of the 21st century, when uh, this um, internet-based platform cap capitalism didn't arrive, but there was a satellite-based global media scenario, especially in the 1990s and 2000s, right? And at that mm -hmm. time, 
what was China's policy uh, to to the uh, actually as as media student and uh, media scholar we have been studying this rise of global media and the concentration and everything but actually we missed out uh, what was China uh, silently doing that time right so we right of course shed yes, some light yes. on that. China had protectionist policy and they, to date there is still somewhat protectionism is there for foreign direct investments in, uh, you know, like television, telecommunication, media industry in that sector. But there are bypasses through uh, like uh, co-production, which I will emphasize um, in a moment. But I want to pay a due time for the 20 years period of that we understand as neoliberalization opening period, which is from 1980s to 2000. So what happened during that period, including in China, the Deng Xiaoping in after 1978 understanding with the West uh, and later on in 1980s was the understood as the modern father of neoliberalizing Chinese market. Before that, China was suffering a deficit of uh, uh, moder- enough resources to feed for its large population um, as well as employing them. But what uh, pre-1980s, uh, Maoist China did. They created the foundation with public utilities where uh, the inequality uh, was growing, but still it was uh, benefiting large number of uh, working class and farmer class and rural population. So two of the, or let's say three of the key development that Mao's uh, contribution was in China in 1960s and 70s was uh, healthcare, education, and local infrastructures. So these actually enabled China to participate later in export-driven economic development in which China became the world's factory in, from 1980s and onward. So without that significant development, China would not have the manpower uh, or labor resources that the, the global North needed so much to produce their products so cheaply in China. And everything essentially started to become made in China because of those foundations. So what happened with uh, Deng Xiaoping after that era? They started to incentivize a larger resource allocation for the construction of export processing zones. Mm -hmm. Cities with electricity, roads, transports, schools, hospitals, municipal services, where the foreign investors can start uh, building their industries with local investors and employ local people into factories. So there will be about 250 million people in flow in the next 20 years, where people will migrate from rural areas, come into the cities, live there temporarily, and they will uh, travel back to their homeland when uh, there's a holiday or festivals or any gap time they get, or when their factory is closed temporarily. Um, So they would leave their children behind and their elderly parents will take care of the children. There were situations like that with many thousands of villages where there are only kids and older people because the young people, they all left the villages to go to those factories. Mm -hmm. So that's a factory liberalization. That does not mean China was also having the media industry, telecommunication industry liberalization at the same time. That happened later. But what happened at the same time in other parts of the world, for example, in South Asia, um, is the neoliberal structural adjustment programs. So what mm. it means that uh, neo- neoliberalism became an ideological framework in which uh, it has attached positive connotations such as market priorities, forces and institutions with individual identity, consumption power, uh, citizenship, individual right, individual liberty, and so on. Uh, so it became also an enclosure or mantra for privatization in which uh, commodifying formerly public resources such as water, which used to be a public good, became commodity for people mm-hmm. to uh, benefit from it. Um, neoliberal estate, that means a state did not want to participate anymore in the control or regulation of market as much as they used to. So they thought many of the market policies, let, let the market decide what should it be. Um, and then finally, deregulation. What happens is that many uh, there were many restrictive policies that you cannot have this. This belongs to public and government. Uh, so those restrictions were lifted up. That's, therefore, it's called deregulation. There were a regulation, but those regulations were removed. So railways, uh, telephone companies, many of those which used to be dominated by state ownership enterprises or joint state public ownership, they became private entities. They they were open for private investments. So that's exactly where we see the rise of possibility of satellite television coming in, 
which mm. used to be the terrestrial and satellite broadcast uh, at the hand of only state ownership, right? So in 1995, uh, 1995 and 1996, Bangladesh government first gave permission for satellites because they saw how successful Indian satellites uh, televisions are in preparing the market for commodities through advertisements and corporate branding and joint venture with corporations and uh, media companies. So the local elites thought we should also have that. They created a lobbying group to, to the government of that time to enable policies um, for having private satellite televisions. But here is the catch. This protectionism is a limited compromise. They allowed private investment in media sector, but they did not allow foreign investment in the media sector. So not surprisingly, none of the 40 plus satellite channels in Bangladesh is owned by Rupert Murdoch or a Chinese Mughal because- It, it happened in India, right? Informal mechanism, uh, right. The foreign direct investment was allowed in India. In, it was in greatly uh, allowed in India, but Pakistan was also somewhat conservative. Uh, because they saw that we already have India as a regional imperializer. Now, if you allow, allow even Western, uh, you know, for investor to come in in our media sector, we'll have nothing left to control for ourselves, or there will be no propaganda mechanism for the government to use. So they did uh, maintain that uh, up to even, uh, you know, in Bangladesh, it's officially it's allowed foreign ownership, but informally, it is protected by a nexus of political commercial power that we term as political commercial nexus. Mm -hmm. It happens very informal, that filtering. Mm -hmm. But rest of the world, there was a creation of three-tier media system. The first tier is the most global of all in which you have um, like five or six mega companies like Disney, News Corporations, Time Warner, uh, 21st Century Fox, which is previously known as News Corporation, Sony, Comcast, Vivendi, uh, and mega advertisers uh, dominated by the West, such as Unilever. And you, and on the you second know tier, Bartelsman. we have Bartelsman too. Yes, in, yes. In on Europe. the second tier, yeah. yeah, we have these local giants in which we have like uh, ZTV, uh, Reliance, uh, and the advertisers like Colgate Palmolive India, Unilever India. India actually here served as the Trojan horse for bringing in Western money and power into cultural industries for to flowing in eventually to its neighbor. And on the third tier, we have this local media elites, like in mm. Bangladesh, it would be Beximco, Boshundara uh, group. So China saw this happening, but they also had to feed the, you know, um, the entertainment market for the large demographic. So their satellite television industry is also one of the world largest. Their television okay. market is one of the- Okay, now, now we need to enter in the second part of the discussion, the Chinese digital, Silk Road, and uh, um, uh, my curiosity is, what do you mean when you say digital Silk Road? Uh, I, I I need to know from you. Sure, uh, digital Silk Road is a little bit different from, let's say, China's media uh, and uh, entertainment industry liberalization, in which you have this transnational co-production capacity. For example, mm -hmm. ten cents. Uh, it invested in Warner Brothers to co-produce movie like Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. um, Venom movie. You heard about that? It's uh, they co-produced it with Sony. Mm -hmm. Tencent also invested in uh, Paramount Pictures uh, to co-produce Top Gun Maverick. So there is certain compromise that they do not here care about national sentiment. They do not need to be seen as Chinese. There is no need for being patriotic. It's about money, right? Like transnational mm -hmm. corporations. Yes, this is my yeah. question. Uh, uh, I have one question in this um, juncture of the discussion that is, uh, so we have discussed about the global, new, new liberal global media. And also in the new, new 21st century, we were getting this platform capitalism. So exactly, uh, wh where do you put this digital Silk Road project uh, uh, is it in between or it is covering both global and uh, platform capital? Right. So that, that's where I was going, actually. So China's media industry, its transnationalization using Alibaba, uh, Tencent and Wanda Group, they have uh, actually a kind of denationalized characteristics. It's about making money. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to their digital wing, they have a different nature in which 
part of Tencent, you know, that uh, WeChat is one of the largest uh, super app or mega app in mm -hmm. which you have uh, different features like uh, Amazon, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all in one. So okay. they, saw, they can be also using it for financial transactions into the expanding market where Chinese businesses are going. So China's digital uh, Silk Road therefore has a very strong nationalistic uh, role to play in China's internationalization of its currency, as well as popularizing its services um, to, uh, for other parts. So the same company, its media wing is liberalized and in pro, you know joining the co-production with the western uh, counterparts but its digital parts it's seen uh, with suspicious eye that is it china's you know party's vehicle for spying or surveillance mm -hmm. or using during wartime uh, so that's why they have some restrictions so china's digital silk road is actually um, it's a venture for taking a share into the global platform capitalism Mm -hmm. So what is platform capitalism? Platform capitalism is uh, both infrastructures and intermediaries for digital capitalism. So they create a pipeline between the users and the data or the commodity. They serve as an intermediary. So platforms are, there are many types of platforms, such as the advertisement platform. Google mm -hmm. search is an advertisement platform. YouTube is an uh, you know, audio visual, but also advertisement platform. But one of the key areas where competition is happening is cloud platforms in mm -hmm. addition to, um, you know, like advertisement platforms such as Amazon Web Services yeah. is a cloud platform that provides services to CIA, to Pentagon, to, you know, like a canvas. Many that parties. Parties, yes, yeah. it's like super app of all, like the, the, it's their main cash source. But there is also uh, Alibaba, uh, World Trade Electronic Platform, which is kind of similar, but they also have this fintech in, inside it. So fintech is their financial transaction technology in which Alipay is an integral part of the Alibaba app. So that actually uh, it's headache for the West because that's Alipay and Alibaba business, Alibaba's investments uh, and Alibaba's electronic world trade platform, they're all very popular in large part of Asia and going into Africa mm -hmm. with Chinese investments. Mm -hmm. So that is a part of the China's Belt and Road initiatives in which yeah, this is, corporations... This is very interesting. Uh, uh, please allow me to interrupt. That is, sure. they, we, we hear that uh, they have kind of um, censorship in the social media platforms. So they have developed their own Twitter that is called Weibo, right? And also mm -hmm. they, they have created uh, some platforms which is becoming very global, like TikTok, right? It was initiated yes. by China, but it is now a very global platform. So how, how, yes. how do they balance this uh, uh, notion of censoring freedom of expression at the same time, opening platforms uh, uh, for, for capitalist market, for global market and everything? So you were talking about Alibaba and their their all 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 services they offer, um, but at the same time we ha we we get get some news about a very restricted uh, uh, digital platform. How they uh, balance this whole thing? Right. So here we are by referring by they we mean Chinese, but Chinese are not one entity, right? So there is government enterprises, uh, there is governmental body for regulation. There is party, which is in the power of the government. And mm -hmm. there is also corporations, which is independent from the government, private entities, but they must comply with government's requirement, policy mm -hmm. issues, restrictions, and so on, right? So with that, uh, there is always suspicion that the Chinese uh, corporations, transnational corporations, basically can be used by the Chinese uh, Communist Party and People's Liberation Army anytime they need. But we, this is not, a, you know, like exclusive to China. We know that in United States, all the top uh, tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, they also give access to National Security Agency, NSA. And Edward Snowden uh, revealed about this Prism project in which they yeah. were able to access to any internet content data as well as mobile phone contents. Uh, whenever they wanted. And so they have the biggest, uh, you know, Five Eye Alliance, the, which is spearheaded by the United States with Australia, uh, New Zealand, United Kingdom and Canada joining United States, especially after 9-11. Uh, 
uh, they have the biggest security apparatus all, all around the world for utilizing the private platforms uh, for data collection and control and manipulation if they want to. They have that infrastructure capacity. So China also developed parallel capacity, right? China has, in addition, what we know as Great Firewall, uh, in which the IP addresses of particular websites are blocked, uh, mm -hmm. that they cannot be used from within inside China without the use of VPN and other mechanisms. There are some limited resources. For example, mm -hmm. Google mm -hmm. actually did uh, business in China, but they failed eventually to comply with the Chinese government's requirement for data providing. And they also were inferior compared to Baidu, uh, which had a more incentive from the government and support for providing better uh, artificial intelligence uh, using, you know, like translation of Chinese um, into connecting to businesses. Uh, so it's a geopolitical contest in which you have these uh, super mega companies of information technology from America dominating most of the world, but mm -hmm. China insulated. They saw what Facebook, uh, Google is capable of doing for its own government and what it is becoming, uh, essentially data colonizing forces, uh, they wanted to have their own apparatus doing it. They wanted to have something that they can be, they can control within their own, uh, you know, like- Can you please uh, uh, connect the, this discussion yeah. with the rise of BRICS? Uh, yes, of course. So BRICS, um, that's why the name or NOICO movement discussion again comes back. So mm -hmm. this global South, the countries that actually started to neoliberalize, but yet they wanted to have uh, media infrastructures of their own, uh, as well as economies of their own, without the influence and control of the West, they got united, right? So there were many kind of groupings. So BRICS was one of that grouping since 2000 and so on. Uh, you have uh, Russia, China, India, South Africa, and Brazil coming together, forming an economic alliance uh, for internal trading. So they established their own banks uh, for supporting their businesses uh, with their own kind of contingency reserve for loans, as well as own agreements for free trade uh, zones and uh, rules. Uh, but the BRICS has nothing also in common in between. They all have different demographic politics um, and they also have internal reason for disliking each other. For example, China, India, they are participants in BRICS and they do engage in heavy trading uh, comparing to many uh, other countries. But China holds an upper hand here because uh, India has massive trade deficit with them, them. So while they do BRICS, but China, India also opposes uh, China's Belt and Road initiatives. Uh, Russia and China are seen as ally, but they are also suspicious in terms of influence when it comes to Central Asia or part of Eastern Asia, which Russia considers within its own sphere is now being taken over by Chinese soft power, where mm. people wants to learn more Chinese so they can do business with Chinese people instead of uh, you know, learning Russians in the school. Uh, so there is this kind of uh, tension there, but there's also possibility of having alternative uh, block, but that did not materialize. One of the biggest failure of BRICS was B BRICS cable itself. So in 2012 and 13, especially after the Snowden revolution that uh, United States is spying using its infrastructures, internet infrastructures on other countries' leaders, mm -hmm. uh, Brazilian leaders are so furious that they said, we want to build a straight internet connection to Europe bypassing the United States. It did not happen because the government changed. But it also did not happen. The BRICS project, the cable project, the fiber optics cable of their own, it did not happen because India has more gravity to United States IT industries. So they did not invite China to the net mundial conversation for alternative uh, infrastructures or governance of internet. So BRICS cable did not materialize precisely because of their internal commitment uh, issues. They don't have the, uh, you know, like same commitment. Each country have different kind of geopolitical. This much differences, uh, uh, is it? BRICS working really well uh, in, in the new scenario? It's a, one of the many alliances. The bigger alliances, like uh, now we have uh, SEO, uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, and we also have uh, other 
economic forums emerging. For example, China's Belt and Road is it's it's seen as its own initiative to integrate countries with its own uh, trade routes mm -hmm. and building infrastructures necessary for making that trade happen. So India is very much opposed to that because a part of Belt and Road goes through part of the disputed areas uh, into Pakistan that gives Pakistan legitimacy for having that part as considered as China-Pakistan economic corridor. So India is very much uh, critical of Belt and Road initiatives, but also because of the border issues, right? Because of losing face in the uh, conflict in border in 2020, they banned 118 Chinese apps while also doing trade uh, is still dependent for part of the trade uh, in uh, Chinese companies like Xiaomi, OnePlus, Oppo. Uh, they all dominate Indian cell phone market. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, you have this Amazon AWS uh, being used by Indian government for its cloud service. Mm -hmm. uh, also Microsoft Azure, Oracle, used by Indian companies and government services. So they have more influence over Indian policies that it helped to ban Chinese apps. So it indirectly tilted the level playing field towards United States in which Google is investing $10 billion in the US uh, company investing in Indian data market. Facebook bought 5% of Reliance Geo. Uh, so that is its bypass for getting into Indian data market, right? So mm -hmm. they, we, I see that as a geopolitical push and pull in which India want to have digital sovereignty but they are still lured by the dependency on U.S. platforms, so it's slowing down India's own, um, you know, like uh, in innovations and inventions of own platforms. So it will take long, much longer time for India to have super apps uh, like uh, Facebook or WeChat uh, or even Amazon AWS. As if they're as long as they're dependent. They're blocking Chinese apps, which is helping their own local market in a way. But as long as they're dependent on U.S. platforms, I don't see India being able to reach the level where NAM envisioned to have their mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. communication infrastructures. Okay. And BRICS could have been an opportunity, but it turned into yeah. an internal struggle for legitimacy. That we see. Uh, one last thing uh, we need to discuss that is uh, a very new uh, arena we, we are observing. It is on rise. That is the space in the area of space communication, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, what what is happening in that uh, in that arena? Sure. So, space communication is the frontier for uh, communication uh, challenges in the future, right? At uh, playing mm -hmm. out in the present. So digital Silk Road requires telecommunication. Telecommunication requires satellite navigation as well as uh, other satellite internet infrastructures. So a part of digital Silk Road is interested, for example, uh, providing support uh, to uh, Huawei and ZTE and the apps that will have Chinese um, investments mm -hmm. will also have the Chinese navigation support. So. China developed its own alternative satellite navigation system. So when it comes to satellite navigation system, by our default assumption is we call the word GPS, mm -hmm. right? Global positioning system. It's in our cell phone, it's in our car, in, it's in our smart devices and gadgets. Uh, but GPS is actually one of the four or five services in the world. Which GPS is dominated by the US. Uh, but there are other uh, players. For example, China's satellite navigation system is called Beidou, right? It's a, um, it has about 30 plus, like currently 42 as of 2022 satellites, which are functional in orbit and providing alternative uh, navigation to Pakistan and many parts of China's partners in Belt and Road initiatives. So this is one of their digital or a space silk road initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, we have also Galileo, which is an European satellite navigation. We have GLONASS, GLONASS which is um, Russian uh, satellite navigation in, in parallel to, um, let's say, US GPS. So this is, uh, is often presented as a threat for United States supremacy in the space, China's rise of space industry. Uh, but it all pales when it comes to the power of space X. Uh, owned by Elon Musk. Uh, as of 2022 September, SpaceX has over 2,300, 2,300 functional Starlink satellites in orbit that um, uh, has 
half million active subscriber. They subscribe internet. Uh, so that's an alternative internet infrastructures, right? To mm. fiber optics uh, or other forms. Uh, now get this, if we're worried about China's having 300, 400, 500 satellites, Russia also have less. The US FCC, the Federal Communication Commissions, it approved 11,900 satellites of SpaceX to uh, you know, come in next couple of years. By mm -hmm. 2024, SpaceX will have about 4,000 satellites in the sky. Oh my God. No other entity on earth can mm -hmm. match that compete with that. So we'll continue to see United States dominate uh, the space communication industry for a long time. But what is also here different is rise of India. So in 2017, India launched about 104 satellites into orbit in one rocket. So that was hailed as one of the scientific marvel and many of the projects were actually women run, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in recently, last month, uh, in October 2022, India's uh, new Space India Limited, it's the commercial wing of India's space uh, agency, ISRO, it launched 36 British satellites in, in its LVM-3 rocket. So now let's look at the bigger picture. India, former colony of Britain, now launching a rocket carrying British commercial satellites into its own rocket. Mm. Uh, so India definitely has evolved and, uh, you know, gained its reputable, uh, respectable, you know, ranking in the space industry. But it is still, they're launching British satellites. <laughs> so they need to have the capacity to have their more satellites of their own so that they don't have to depend on Western satellite links for global internet connections. And they keep, can even sell that. Um, and there's also like other players like United uh, Arab Emirates sent Hope Mars orbiters. Like they're one of the few nations that aiming for Mars uh, competing with US and China. So China has this own space, uh, you know, international space agency is, is they don't allow Chinese. It's very uh, curious case to me that about 239 individuals from 19 countries have uh, visited International Space Station as of 2020, 239 individuals, not a single one from China. Okay. Why is that? It's because in 2011, US Congress passed a law that NASA or its science and technology office cannot collaborate with any Chinese entity. So they cannot actually get into International Space mm -hmm. Station. So they developed their own space um, station. Stamps. Yeah. Yes. Own Mars mission, uh, own satellite. Actually, it was China in 2019, first time, sent a probe on the far side of the moon where the United States hasn't been there yet. So there are elements that can make us worried about, oh, is China is the next uh, space su supreme power? No. <laughs> if we look at SpaceX, United States will continue to dominate that. But when you look at China's growth of business in the space industry, with the Asian and African countries, then United States see that as a threat because they're losing the market on that areas. Uh, that means less money for US companies mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. more money for China, but not more money than United States as a whole. So that's the point. Like US will continue to dominate what okay. UNESCO Right Commission warned us against. So uh, we are at the end of the discussion. Um, so. We have been experiencing this U.S. domination since uh, the the World Second World War was over. Then, in recent times, we we have been observing the uh, attempts by China with their digital circle project. Also, there are some other actors uh, who are coming forward, like India, and he have said about UAE and some other uh, aspiring candidates. So what will happen to the uh, countries who are in peripheral uh, reality, who are just the receiver of this, uh, of this, uh, say, global communication warfare? Um, that would be our yes. concluding, concluding segment. Of sure, of course. Thank you. So uh, dependency on communication industry will continue because we are dependent on high-tech industries on global north for many other industries, such as automobile. Well, Bangladesh do not have their own 
uh, cars because it's cheaper to buy cars from other two than to establish their entire industry. But that doesn't mean that it cannot change. Bangladesh has built ships that has been exported in other parts of the world, right? Maybe not super high tech like Western ones, but it's still functional. Um, Ready-made garments industry is one of the areas, but that's at the expense of, as you point out in your conversation, that it, at the expense of cheap body, cheap labor, right? That are dispensable, thousands can die without justice. Uh, so as long as these countries are dependent on the global North for supplying their raw material, including cheap bodies, cheap labor, and natural resources, in order to gain access to their uh, heavy industries and high-tech industries, there will be no independence or true decolonizations. Uh, they will continue to dominate uh, the local uh, buyers. The market will be continue to dominate and profit the global north, but we'll see more and more rise of the global south core countries or same pair of countries competing with the core and eventually try to become core and uh, becoming regional imperializers, such mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. India's reliance entertainment or reliance telecommunication is mm -hmm. one of the biggest ones in that case. We'll see that uh, is emerging from Brazil, that is emerging from part of Middle East, uh, that is emerging from China. So United States hegemony will not be uh, uncontested. It will be contested. So there'll be more and more uh, bans, more regulations, more uh, national sovereignty driven discourses from the leaders trying to use it for their own surveillance mm -hmm. and control of media um, in which you will see that reliances um, Ambani said that American companies are data colonizers we need to have our own data resources India itself is a regional colonizer right regional mm -hmm. imperialist power so and a corporation is using that discourse to promote mm -hmm. their own uh, liberal market Interesting. And so we'll see that contest will continue to grow. So one solution I see that to uh, pay attention to more cultural diversity of expression. So if you cannot have diversity in infrastructures, mm -hmm. while you can continue to protect and reserve your space is in the pro in the cultural expressions. That means more uh, celebration of unique cultural identities and uh, media contents, as opposed to more restriction of them which many governments, including governments of Bangladesh, they want to do in film industry, in telecom industry, in television, and of course, in social media. And as you have, your work have done excellent work in finding out. Thank you. It was a great conversation. At least I felt in that way, and I uh, learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Anis, for uh, joining me. And uh, we'll continue our conversation in, in other forms, right? Um, Thank you. So, I really enjoyed the conversation too. Thank you for that's the end of the discussion and the conversation. Uh, I, I need to conclude here. Thank you all.